Well, hey, everyone. This is Joe Heiler from SportsRehabExpert.com, and today I'm on the phone with David O'Sullivan. Uh, a lot of you guys know David. He's been on here a few times in the past, and he's written numerous articles for us. But for those of you that don't, uh, David is a physical therapist and strength and conditioning specialist originally from Ireland. Uh, he's now, or he has been, the head physio uh, for the Huddersfield Giants Rugby Club uh, in the U.K., as well as treating and consulting with numerous other uh, patients and professional athletes. So um, David's been trained in a number of different systems, uh, which we're going to talk a bit about today and talk about how he's integrated those into his practice. And, um, you know, he's he's taken a lot of that great information and in, that he's learned over the years, and he's really kind of turned it into, you know, some cool new online courses and a mentorship program that he's going to be discussing a bit as well. So, David, it's always good to have you on here. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Great to, to talk to you again. Yeah, well, and then why don't we start out with, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been up to lately, because I know you told me you got some new things going on, so. Yeah, um, yeah, it's kind of a, a, not a crossroads, but but a big change in my life at the moment. Um, I spent the last eight years kind of working in, in professional rugby league and rugby union, um, you know, since, since pretty much I graduated and you know, I've learned learned a lot, and you know, I'm, I'm certainly in that environment. It's a different environment. Um, obviously, I've, I've had the, the clinics on the side, the private clinic, um, and so just with with two young girls now, um, a five year old and a, and a one and a half year old. You know, I felt it was time to take a break from the, the professional sport. So, just come out. Uh, just finished with the with the Huddersfield Giants there um, in November um, to focus more on the the, the pro sport academy. Um, which obviously you know uh, we we can chat about if you want, but more kind of helping others now um, learn from my mistakes, but also what worked really well for me in pro sport because you know it's quite a daunting environment um, to to succeed in really, um, and you know it's quite challenging. And so you know I felt there was nothing really out there that was preparing you know therapists uh, to kind of be successful in this environment. So that's where where kind of my head's at now is. Just trying to help others now um, in that in that kind of environment. Um, on the back of that, then uh, just you know, I really want to get my my clinic um, in in Huddersfield kind of to the next level, really. And you know, my goal is is to have one of the top clinics in the country. Um, you know, that that's a goal I set for myself a few years ago. So just having the time and energy to to put structures in place now and, and really make sure my clinicians that are working with me are you know are, are delivering a top class. Um, you know, um, system as well to make sure that we have everything in place to to help patients out of pain, really. So between the two of those, um, I'm pretty busy. Actually, I'm probably busier than than when I was in pro sport, but I can have my weekends back a little bit now, which is which is nice as well with with two young kids. Well, and then let's start out talking a little bit about just kind of your your philosophy and treatment approach, because I know you've you've been training a lot of different systems as well. So you can just kind of give us your overall approach and then maybe we'll get a little more specifically into some of the systems that you you've been trained in and just you know kind of give like a brief overview of some of that yeah um i mean my my thinking the more experience i get the the more i'm stepping back if um i'll explain what i mean by that in a second you know I, i've done various courses you know i've spent a lot of money on on constantly trying to improve and and the more i go into it now and kind of take a step back and, and see the person in front of me rather than a set of muscles, ligaments, nerves, you know, but actually see the person. You know, that, that's been pretty, um, pretty I would say, life-changing, really, in, in terms of how I, how I approach um, people now. And, and, you know, I use the word people. And, you know, I, I've studied various systems that, you know, we perform a test if it's, you know, if it's this or if it's that, we do this exercise and we do that exercise to to um, improve the test. And since I've stopped um, kind of focusing on um, using exercises to improve tests and actually focus on the person and focus more on that perceived threat that their nervous system is given, that's where I've seen very, very quick changes. And I've been able to retest people using these tests that, that I have been trained in. And you know, surprisingly, at the start, all these tests are, are showing up fine then again. And, you know, it's when, when you kind of step back and you look at the nervous system, um, you know, and movement behavior, it's physical therapists. Ultimately, that movement behavior is um, is a result of the perception 
um, of the you know of the subconscious mind and and the interaction from from various tissues as part of one big system. And you know my ultimate goal with a patient now is you know what is their biggest perceived threat, and the the perceived threat is in the subjective history. You know and and Carl Morris, a sports psychologist, um, I work closely with. Um, you know he taught me to you know ask better questions, you'll get better answers. And, you know, and that's been very important for me. And really, I'm focusing on that now. And that's what I'm kind of teaching in the mentorship is to, you know, to really be thorough with our subjective assessment, find out what the biggest threats to that person are, both emotional and physical from past medical history. And then from there, you know, working really hard to reassure our patients, reassure their nervous system that they're safe. And, you know, my approach now really is, um, you know, restoring their physiology getting them away from fight or flight and certainly away from the extreme part of fight or flight back towards rest and digest because we're always going to want to go into fight or flight but we just don't want to be predominantly living in that so we will get their physiology restoring their breathing and that's a big one that we can um, convince their nervous system that they're safer if their neurology um, you know the cranial nerves are working well with their breathing um, you know their tongues on the roof of their mouth their lips are closed um, then we also have to reassure the patient that actually, you know what, pain is just an output of the brain. It doesn't mean damage. It doesn't mean that there's tissues damaged. And very often when you get those two right and you spend the time with people with those two, very often that guarded postures and, and various other bits that, that you're seeing as a reaction to their perceived threat start to melt away. And then from there, then I'll usually... Um, everything I tend to do now is gait related and you know PRI and anatomy and motion and, and various courses they've had a big influence kind of connecting a few dots for me really and then you kind of go into the more kind of manual muscle testing type courses like PBTR and, and um, NKT stuff um, you know I I don't use them like the traditional way they're taught but at the same time they've been in, instrumental in me getting to where my thought process is um, in that, you know, I use isometrics now as just a low level way to decrease the perceived threat in gay patterns before then we get them to stand up and put more load on them, you know, and then, um, you know, I took a fall off uh, with Joe Candle there, um, structural joint balancing, and, you know, that completely then brought, you know, clicked a lot of things into place for me in, in terms of treating the body as one system and looking at the relationship between the diaphragm and pelvic floor and the reaction of that to stress, whether it's internal and external stress and the effect that that's having on the posture. So kind of restoring all that. And then it's just a continuum with the progression. And ultimately the progression is we progress the patient to what they're able to withstand without increasing the stress so much that the subconscious perceives a threat again and they, they go into this fight or flight strategy. So it really is a game of, uh, of cat and mouse to a point where we're giving them a little bit, but not too much that we, we put them back into into um, a predominantly fight or fr- flight um, strategy where they lose movement variability, they go rigid again, you know, they lose weight distribution through their um, through their feet again. And, and that's kind of the stuff I'm putting on, on the blogs at the moment, which, you know, uh, um, I'm sure that um, those articles, um, I'll send them through to you as, you know, it's a lot of the stuff we see, I think, is a reaction to the fight or flight response of the nervous system, as opposed to, you know, actually truly being the cause. And, and once I've stepped back and, and I continue to step back and I look at the person and I get that history better, that then guides me a lot quicker into where I start my treatment rather than just focusing on, OK, this test, this test and this test is showing up as as being dysfunctional, you know, we're going to start there actually going, what's the, the biggest stresses here to the to the patient? And that's probably the biggest thing that, that I've changed in the last even two years, you know, and, and even since, you know, I started writing articles for you, you know, it's, it's changed massively my, my approach as I continue to learn and, and continue to um, to piece pieces of the puzzle together. We're certainly treating the body as one organism now is, has been, um, been massive for me personally, you know. Well, that's an area that's only going to, get better and you know things evolve and we learn more about the brain science and how the nervous system relates i mean there's i mean yeah we'll we'll definitely be looking at that stuff more and more but so i'm glad that you're you know you're obviously talking about it and working that in so i mean we'll i'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that but one of the 
things, I guess, and I th- I'm thinking this this group is, I think they are from the UK anyways, but could you talk a little bit about that anatomy in motion and, um, you know, that system and, and kind of what you've learned from them? Because I think they are from the, are they in the UK? Yeah, yeah, that that's Gary Ward, um, anatomy in motion, and, and that, that course is really good for me as well, and that's kind of your, your three-dimensional movement, um, you know, and you know, if you if you had to liken a twenting, um, you know, and and you know, I'm sure Gary would acknowledge that Gary Gray, uh, you know, his work is very similar to that, and, and I'm sure had, a, had had some influence in Gary Ward's work. Um, you, you know, you're obviously um, familiar with Gary Gary Gray's stuff, aren't you? Yeah. And what Gary's done is he's basically tried to map the body using the flow motion model into specific parts of gait. Um, so he's kind of looked at it um, purely through gait rather than just your generic three-dimensional movement stuff. So that was that was really useful for me just to to see the reactions kind of in more detail in regards to gait. Um, and then I was able to obviously have the PRI version, which kind of look at gait more from a concentric point of view, if that makes sense. Whereas Gary Ward stuff's more eccentric. And then what I was what I'm doing is kind of not using one or the other, but trying to put it all together to, to meet halfway, really, um, because there's, there's discrepancies between the two, really, um, you know, as, as there always will be um, between different ses- systems. So just trying to put it together and not try focus on, you know, getting a person perfect in in one part of it, because I think that's unrealistic nowadays, you know, because, you know, if the shoes that we wear is going to change the reactions throughout the body, the, the surface we're on, but just to um, imp- use these systems to improve movement variability. That's probably the biggest thing, you know, that I've got is is to understand more that it's it's important that we give um, patients movement options as opposed to using that same rigid strategy consistently. So being, you know, Gary's stuff really influenced me, and um, I studied Gary Gray's stuff a lot um, before I took Gary Ward's course, and then Gary Ward just cleared up a few things for me. I think Gary Ward teaches his course very clear. Um, and he's, he's a really good teacher. So th- that cleared up a few things that I learned in the past, if that makes sense, through, through Gary Gray stuff as well. So I suppose um, it, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's, it's the same as Gary um, Gray's work by any means. I wouldn't insult either of them. You know, I think they're going down different um, paths, definitely. But, you know, it, it, it's similar to that it, it, if someone wanted a kind of a comparison. Well, and then what about, um, like, I know you've been using a lot of the PRI stuff lately, too, and you did talk a little bit about, you know, breathing being a, a big part of that. But could you talk just a little bit about, you know, how you integrate PRI into what you do and kind of your, your journey, you know, using uh, using their system into and integrating it into what you do? Yeah, like PRI again was really, really important for me in, in understanding gait better. Um, and understanding reactions and patterns, you know, that um, that that the body kind of tends to take or, or favor. And again, you know, I see a lot of these patterns that PRI are identifying as compensation patterns, you know, ultimately. So, um, again, I've taken a step back a little bit and, and I still use the tests very much to check my work. But I, I don't necessarily follow the, the PRI um exercise prescription as a war you know and and i think to really get good at pri you really need to finish that course and martin um my colleague he's like the first prc in um in the uk now at pro sport physio as well martin higgins and you know he's gone over to to america to to finish it and you know that kind of system i think you really do have to finish the whole thing to to give a true um kind of reflection of of that course because when you know a little bit of information is dangerous to a point um so you know you, when, when you start changing things you don't fully understand that that's i think where, where we can get into trouble and i've learned that in pro sports as well a little bit you know when you're trying things out a little bit and things don't go quite as you expect so but um but to answer that question they were fundamental and for me transferring the patterns into more isometric patterns um and trying to um get you know, get these given these low um, low thresholds, um, or certainly you know decreasing that perceived threat in these patterns, but using similar patterns, but maybe just tweaking them a little bit from PRI, but changing the the inhalation or the exhalation, you know, while I activate these patterns. Now, and that's where I'm at at the moment is trying to 
you know, if if I want to try control anterior tilt, then I know I need to control my inhalation because that's when the diaphragm is going to come down. That's when the pelvic floor is going to lengthen and that's what's going to link the rib cage to the pelvis. You know, so trying to get that control through the breath, you know, reassure the patient they're safe in these patterns. That's where I think, you know, the, the power is coming from really is putting all these things together. Um, so, you know, PRI was in, you know, very, very instrumental in me getting to where I'm at now, but I wouldn't really say I'm using the, the PRI exercises to, to get to where I want to go. But I think the, the real value in the PRI is the test, you know, being able to recheck my, my work at the end, really make sure that, that, that people can pass these tests. Well, this thing too, I think when most people think of PRI, and I know <clears throat> sometimes I kind of get stuck in this, this idea too, that there's all these exercises you do on the floor, these hip lifts and different things to, you know, to deal with these, you know, these normal asymmetries that you're going to find. But what I think gets lost sometimes is the ultimate goal is to get people reciprocal and alternating in their movements, which is gait. Um, They all relate back to gait. And that's something I know, like I I tend to forget it sometimes too. So I'm kind of wondering, so with that in mind, how does PRI and anatomy and motion, I mean, do those those two systems then sound like they would kind of work well since they're both really based off of gait in the first place? Yeah, they don't like left AFIR is is a combination of a few parts of gait that anatomy and motion would suggest. You know, if if um, if you, at any moment in gait, you know, if you if you kind of stop, you know, you, you took left AFIR as one part of gait, you know, that that PRI want to to get you to own, so to speak. That's the rib cage mechanics and the pelvis mechanics would kind of. Um, be two separate parts of where anatomy and motions would suggest. So it's kind of a combination of a few of kind of left stance, transitioning from a pronated to a supinated foot and then shifting over to um, to the other leg, if, if you want to talk in, in their terminology. So I don't think they fit 100% with each other, but the, the, the 80-90% of it does, you know. So that's that's what I mean. Is like an I agree 100%. Every every PRI exercise is gait. You know, it's designed with gait in mind. And that's, you know, Martin always says this, that PRI is a neuro technique. It's not a, a musculoskeletal technique. And I I probably just prefer isometric type movements now um, just to have that conscious um, intention to fire the pattern rather than focus on more dynamic movements like concentric type movements. Because I think that's where, um, you know, you can get these kind of strategies and um, and kind of compensations. Like that's where sometimes people may not feel like a left. Ad- I see a doctor or, or a right glute max. They might see it in their. They might feel it in their tibant. You know, something like that. And and that's probably where you know I've tried all the PRA exercises and, and I've just kind of stepped back a little bit and just found w- better ways that suit me. You know, and and it takes years. You know, to to teach these PRA exercises as well. You know, and, and that's experience, and that's why, you know, the top PRI clinicians are, are really good at what they do because they can spot in a second why that, why that patient isn't recruiting what they want to recruit, you know, or, or, or whatever. So, you know, you know, someone to take a, a weekend course, you know, you, you really do have to invest in it and, and, you know, give it the time. And, you know, I'm, I'm decent with the PRX, PRX so I can teach them, I can understand you know, why things aren't happening a lot now. And, um, you know, but as I said, you know, I, I probably just would 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 um, go a little bit different now in terms of how I try to achieve the exact same thing that PRI are trying to achieve. Well, I mean, can you talk a little bit too just about how you've integrated these into, I mean, I know you're not, you know, now you're officially not, you know, in the professional rugby anymore, but, you know, when you were, kind of how was it a, quite a challenge to integrate it into what you were already doing? Um, you know, and I guess just kind of that process you went through. Could you talk about that a little bit? But then I also wanted to have you talk a little bit about how you guys incorporated maybe some of that stuff into the strength and conditioning programs as well. Yeah. Um, it it, was, it it wasn't hard because at the end of the day, once you get results for your athletes, they don't care. Um, so they'll buy into it straight away if you get a result. And we've we've tried all stars down down the Giants, you know. And if I go on a course, I'll try it, you know. And I'll make my mind up after I've tried it, you know. If I've done a course the weekend, Monday, Tuesday, they're getting that treatment, you know. Some players, and and I'll test it, and then I'll I'll give it a few weeks, and I'll see if stuff's sticking, or, 
you know if it's not sticking and and so I've tried all sorts based on on the um on the course I've been on but, but what I would say is when I go on a course in these I'll get that course to fit into my way of thinking and my system overall so it doesn't kind of take over if that makes sense and I think that's where people struggle when you know they forget every good thing they've learned in the past and they try this way whereas if you just integrate the good parts of the course that you've been on you can see how this fits into your system then it's just adding that one percent five percent to your own system to make it even better whereas you know I, I like to say you know if you're trying to learn a system you're only ever going to be a fraction of the person that truly understands that system so you know and I, and I encourage everyone on my mentorship to to develop their own systems, use what they want from me, but just just make sure that it's continually progressing their own systems. Um, but to, to kind of answer that, I think it it just needs to a lot of stuff needs to be at the right time as well. You know, when, when we give these interventions, they need to be at the right stage of of the their nervous system needs to be at the right right stage as well. I think. But to you know, it. Ultimately, I I don't I try not to complicate it. I want to get people's diaphragm and pelvic floor working well together. I want to give them full length, which is then going to improve their movement. Then that's going to allow the fascia to slide better, which is going to improve your force absorption, which is going to take care of your your tendon problems. You know, and and how we get there, you know, it it just depends on that patient. Like sometimes I might use manual therapy. Sometimes I might use those those isometrics. You know, or or it's a combination. Um, and so it, it hasn't been too hard, but the, what I do is I still know where I want to get a patient from point A to point B, and I know I need to get them back on the field where they're durable. Um, so I know what they need to be able to do to get there, and then it's just a case of, of tweaking or, or, or you know um, doing something based on what I think they need. And sometimes it doesn't work, and sometimes I will go back to an old technique that I've done, and it works great. You know, I remember doing mulligans and. You know, I was getting great results with them, and I know I understand why it was. And you know, sometimes I haven't got the belt out in a while, to be fair. But you know, sometimes there, there is a place for that stuff. So it's, um, but yeah, it, it it was it was it's easy when when you have your own system, you understand what ultimately your goals for that athlete and where you need to get them to. It's not that hard to to implement this stuff, you know, because it it doesn't take over, or it doesn't, um, you know, you don't try to just use that. You just try to get that into your your direction and your way of of, um, of thinking. Well, one of the things I guess you know you'd be a good one to to ask this too because I I think it still comes up for a while there you know everything was you know, it had to be functional and you know I think people were kind of maybe even getting away from you know from some of the traditional you know training techniques and things you know talking more strength and conditioning now and doing all this functional training and then. You know, people are going the other way, saying, "Well, you know, they're not, you know, we're not getting results we want now." So obviously, there's, you know, there's probably a fine line between, you know, I mean, we still need to do strengthening, still need to do powerlifting, still need to do Olympic lifting, you still need to do these things to be powerful, fast, you know, athletes. Um, but then on the other side, you still have to, you know, have the basics right too. They got to breathe right. They got to be, you know, these normal movement patterns. You know, think like you know, think from the FMS to keep them from getting injured too. Um, yeah. You know, could you just talk a little bit about kind of finding that, you know, that middle ground? And I guess, you know, do you still run into that a lot of times? Your trouble with maybe even strength and conditioning staff that are like, you know, they're, they're kind of hesitant to, to work in some of these, you know, I guess they would consider it, you know, a little lower level type of things, but they, they you know, they need to have them. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've been really lucky. And I think because I've got, I'm like, I'll back myself in the strength and conditioning setting against SNCs, you know, when they have, when we have a conversation, you know, we're equal, like, and, and they respect that and I respect their role. So um, I think that, that makes a big difference where they understand that you understand that first and foremost, that athlete needs to be strong and durable to be able to, to play the sport. And, and also as an injury prevention thing, it's, it's very um, important. But at the same time, you know, there's a process to get them strong. And I think once once you both understand that and they understand, as I mentioned, that um, that I'm fully aware of that, then the guard goes down and, and we can interact very easily. And at the end of the day, um, like my last SNC coach, he loved um, working with me and I liked working with him because he was giving good lifts that didn't cause me headaches in the gym, you know, or headaches in the physio room and that, you know, they like, Sometimes I go into the gym and you know I'll see a technique I'm like Jesus you know but 
at the end of the day, he was smart with his lifting, he was smart with his loading, you know, and, and that's a massive um, perceived threat, whereas if the loading isn't great, that's a big increased threat to the nervous system. You know, if we don't get the, the deloading right and, and the time on feet, they're all threats to the nervous system, which ultimately cause injuries. So I think from an S&C point of view, if they're doing that well, then we've got that relationship where we can go, right, that's really good. And then one of the one of the biggest things we focused on as a staff was getting our deceleration progressions well. So, you know, we do a lot of that in our movement prep before they went downfield, a lot of hopping, a lot of deceleration work right down to, to single leg work. And then, you know, Greg at the time was doing a lot of my core work. So he do a lot of kind of, you know, your, your PRI type um, core work as well, which which was good, you know, so he, he'd kind of pull him back out of that um, that fight or flight posture, which essentially is a PEC, you know. Um, so I, I think to kind of answer the question, I think it has to be, they need to understand where you're coming from and you need to understand where they're coming from and then there's not an issue. And we, the movement prep was my thing um, and I was kind of doing a lot of deceleration work with him up to the point where then he was able to concentrate on more acceleration work because I knew then they were able to absorb force as well in the gym, you know, with, with more high level plyometric stuff. And then if we give them loads of movement variability, which is a, a key focus of mine and my injury prevention program, then they've got options to, you know, to to tolerate the load so that they're not just using that same rigid movement pattern all the time under load. I think that helps a lot then as well and, and it stops at least picking up the the silly niggles. And of course we, we did get one or two where, you know, the these lifting injuries where their muscles goes into protective spasm. But, you know, we know what to do with that. You know, we just decrease the perceived threat again. We reassure the brain that that everything's safe and we we can get them back up and and running very, very quickly. So there's never a major issue once once the two of you are working well together. And they, you know, I think the problems happen when your physio is in the physio room doing all his isolated movements and the the S&C is in, in the other side of the room um, just doing his bit, but when when you work together, there's that continuum and there's that athleticism that has to be built. You know that starts from the second that athlete gets injured, or the second your movement screen starts as a physio and pro sport. In my opinion, that's where you you start working towards athleticism, and and the second you start focusing on injury prevention for hamstrings or injury prevention for rotator cuff tears, I just think personally, in my opinion, you're lost because that body everything affects everything else and you know if we do uh, an injury prevention program first and foremost it's just teaching the body how to decelerate their body weight in three dimensions and if you can get that and you get mobility through pelvic floor diaphragm you're not going to pick up silly tendon inj- injuries achilles issues stuff like that because the fascia can slide relative to the skin relative to the muscle you're getting the the direction of the force and then all of a sudden things aren't aren't being um you know, you're not getting these silly injuries, which ultimately SNC is going to blame physio. Physio is going to blame SNC. Whereas, if you've got that continuum with that patient or athlete centered focus in your um, preseason screen, your movement prep or your injury prevention program, right through to the gym where they are developing athletes, then there's no problem. You know, if, if that can answer your question. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, no, oh, definitely. Well, and one thing you brought up that I mean, we I really didn't. Uh think about and I didn't plan on talking about but maybe could you talk a little bit about movement variability yeah like so like there's a lot of research out there now in terms of like injury in in terms of injury prevention especially in kind of occupational settings where they're showing that um, anyone like who's possibly predisposed to back pain or has back pain has decreased movement variability now, that's basically getting from point A to point B and having options to get there so you're not consistently using the same strategy, which makes sense because if you use the same strategy, you get that nociceptive input up to the brain, then the brain eventually is going to turn that. It's going to start listening to it and it's going to start giving a pain output. So that's not surprising when we actually think about it. Now, I see movement variability as a reaction to the threat response. So my, my big tree is um, threat response. So the three R's is response reassure, restore, okay? And, and I very much see that movement variability and the breathing to a point as a response to that perceived threat. So when people get a fright, you know, or, you, or they go rigid or they go into that fight or flight response, that's when they get into these PECs in, you know, PRI terms where they, they go into extension. 
And then if you're in extension, your rib cage is elevated and your diaphragm gets hypertonic, that's, you know, you try drastically rotate or, or side bend, then that's where you're going to get all these facety type pinches in the back and stuff like that. So, you know, I see that as a, a reaction, as I said, to, to fight or flight. And it's something that we need to restore as, um, you know, and reassure the, the nervous system that, that the diaphragm can move well. And if the diaphragm and pelvic floor can, can go through full ranges, the, pel- the rib cage can depress, internally rotate, then you're going to have a lot more movement variability. And the thoracic spine is a big transmitter of forces, you know, and, and I think the thoracic spine is really key for movement variability you know, and the ability to help, you know, the, the fascia to slide as well for force absorption, you know, is, is critical as well. But it's when the the diaphragm, the pelvic floor lose their their ability to lengthen and shorten, that's when the rib cage has to respond to that, in my opinion. And then that's where we start losing that, that movement variability and we go towards rigidity then, you know. Yeah, Does that answer your question like or do you want me to talk about something yeah. else? <laughs> No, I think this, this, that that's good because no, I I think like again having a <clears throat> you know having a system in place where you can evaluate that or assess you know those types of things like whether it's PRI, yeah, and, and the PR, SMA or the PRI, yes, screen to they're, have a they're, way to yeah exactly, and they're all testing movement variability absolutely, and um by the like it does not matter in my opinion what you do, like if we really um rehab the natalie and really decrease that perceived threat all those tests no matter what system you use they sh- you should be passing them you know because ultimately if you can't pass a test then there's a threat response there you know or there's a reason why they can't pass that test and you know and, and on an odd occasion there is you know a significant pathology there but a lot of the time it's just the threat response which you know the the we tend to move towards stuff we like and we, mo- we tend to move away from stuff we don't like and um, and you know that that's all part of that start reflex, really. You know. Mm-hmm. Good. Well, and then why don't we let's spend some time talking then about the, some of the programs you've got going now? Because I know you've got the, the therapy mentorship program, and um, you've also got the online essentials of injury prevention course. Maybe whichever yeah. one you want to hit on first, but let's let's spend some time talking about those, and you know where folks can go to learn more about them. Yeah, so my website is theprosportacademy.com. So it's T H E prosportacademy.com. Um, and again, I, w- I wanted to keep that very practical. Um, my courses aren't master's courses by any means. Uh, you know, everything I do, I want you to be able to apply. And that's first and foremost kind of my whole goal with this is I want to support other therapists and help them be successful in sport now as well, because it is. A challenging environment you know um, and we need a lot of skill sets you know and I almost joke we need to be teachers psychologists nutritionists SNC coaches physios you know mommies to, to athletes at, at certain points of, of the day at, at certain stages of the year so um, I felt that traditional you know degrees wasn't you know and, and even master's degrees weren't giving us that support that we needed so that's where I've kind of um, with the the therapy mentorship program is I've basically sat back and gone right what do what does a therapist need you know to have a full skill set to to be able to succeed here and that's where I've got um you know people from all walks of of life um kind of guest lecturing and you know and then I'm showing them how I apply their techniques so we've got um, like we had Antonio Specco um talking about fascia right down then we Diane Jacobs talking about um like skin stretching dermal norm modulation and pain we've had greg lane and todd hargrove talking about explaining pain to patients and then we, we've got sports psychologists coming on Karen mars is coming on now soon to talk about you know keeping the athlete's attention on useful rather than useless things and and the power of how that emotional response affects the diaphragm which is going to affect your movement variability which is going to affect injury rates so then all of a sudden you can see how everything basically in my opinion links together um and then we've got nutritionists um that are, that are going to talk um we've we've got very few we've got lois laney uh joel crandall so I've, I've just got a broad spectrum of external guest speakers to give real kind of practical um kind of lectures that you know the the students can kind of apply the information tomorrow really and that, that's kind of the, the forefront of it and then the mentorship basically it's over 12 months but you have lifetime access once um, once you kind of um, go through that. 
because I'm always changing and I'm always progressing. And even since, you know, the second class has just started now, six months later, um, I do two classes a year. And, you know, I changed a lot even in six months. And, you know, I'm just showing the first group now. Just, I'm telling them, you know, you need to rewatch this because I've changed a couple of things, how I'm doing things. Now, not massively, but just trying to get those one percenters better to um, to take it to the next level. Um, and so every month that we, we I put up new content right from um, subjective assessment, explaining pain to patients, um, kind of restoring the breathing. That's kind of what we're doing the first month, really. And then it's about like, you know, objective assessments, trying to find that, that true perceived threat, really, and trace it back through the injury history to, to find that. And then reassuring the, the patient and then restoring, you know, the ability of the skin, the fascia, to the slide relative to the muscles and then we take them through that low load rehab progression right through then to a higher level and then back into the snc setting so i tried to give a continuum for every joint in the body how it relates to the to the bigger picture every month really um and then on on month um nine we've got the snc month where we just focus on on strength and conditioning so i've got a few guest lecturers there and then i show them how i've integrated you know, and the biggest things that I've seen, mistakes I've seen in the gym and, and how to correct that. So I want to, at the end of the 12 months, I want um, my students, if you want to call them that, to be, you know, feeling really confident that actually yeah, I've got the skill set here and I, and I know how to take an athlete who is in respiratory distress and who is in, you know, extreme fight or flight and I can take him right through from that point right back into the, the sporting environment and I know with confidence that I've progressed him and, and I've put back a durable athlete who has movement variability, who has restored his breathing, who has de- can decelerate his body weight in three dimensions and, and has passed all the, the kind of progressions that, that I've used in, in professional sport, really. Um, and and that's pretty much that, really. As I said, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly thinking of ways to get it better and, and I'm excited with it. You know, the second group has just started a few weeks ago now and, and we're getting that, that kind of initial um kind of buzz we're getting to see what everyone's using and it's very much it's not a you know look how good i am here the, what i'm showing people is how i do it and i'm not saying for one second this is the only way to do it but i'm showing them how i'd approach it take what you want out of it you know take the good parts that suit your system and and leave the parts that that don't really um complement your system and uh, and know uh, and i say to all my students you know i'm fully expecting you to contribute to this mentorship and improve my system so by the end of the 12 months i'll have advanced a little bit and already there's people putting up stuff on our on our private facebook forum that's making me go that's nice i never thought of that before and i can start implementing that so it's nice for me because it, it makes me put my own system out there and let people critique it and then on the back of that i'm not only um you know teaching them but i'm actually having an opportunity to improve my own system as well which you know i i'll never stop um learning you know i'm, I'm off out to la in in february now to spend four days with, with joel crandall just to you know to learn more in, in about his system because if i if i engage in a course i want to understand it fully rather than you know just un- understanding a small piece of the puzzle because i said that's when i think you get dangerous is when you just start using little bits of courses that you don't fully understand um the you know how they fit into, into a full system so that's kind of the the therapy mentorship program in a, in a nutshell as i said um I, I've got big plans for it. You know, I'm going to make it even more professional. I'm constantly re-videoing content to make it look more professional because I, I've got more time now because I've, I'm not working in pro sport. Um, so, you know, I, I, ultimately I want to give, you know, everything that they need and, and some more, you know, and, and value is ultimately my top priority that they they are getting, you know, much more um, value than, than, um, than, than, you know, than the price suggests. You know, it is a big commitment because it is a year long, but, you know, I, I hope that it will be a good investment for the students. And, you know, the feedback's been brilliant so far. We've we've had physios and, and therapists from, from New Zealand in the Super uh, 15s Rugby Union um, to physios over in the UK um, to, to athletic trainers in Canada working with um, with international teams. So we've got a really broad range of students kind of coming together and it's brilliant to, to create that environment of, you know, there's no egos in there. No one's interested in showing how smart they are, how well-read they are. You know, we all just want to, you know, get better and, and and share a common passion for ultimately getting our patients and, and athletes better, which is brilliant, you know, that I'm able to, to kind of um, be part of that and, and, you know, as I said, you know, help anyone that I can on the process. 
Um, and then the do you want me to talk about the injury prevention program? Well, yeah, we'll do this. We're, real quick, when is the next then um, mentorship program going to start then? So, so that one was that one filled actually. Um, so I've, I've got four people on a waiting list um, for January, which is great, which is really encouraging actually. Um, and the next one starts in June. Um, so it'll probably I don't have the final. I'll presume it'll be like the fourth of June, the first week or the first Monday night in in June really. Um, as I said, I, I usually keep the class to about twenty five people just to to make sure that. That I can answer everyone's questions and and that you know they get my attention really. Um, so so that one will be in June. I've got a couple of little projects, mini projects, um, that that I'm going to get out there now. Um, in the meantime, just to kind of give people a taste of it. Um, and there's like if you go onto the website, there's like a, a free seven day kind of mini course that I do, um, where you can just kind of sign up, pop your email, and then every day I'll, I'll send you kind of um, a snippet of the mentorship so you can kind of get a feel for it. Um, on on the site as well. It's like the seven day sports physio course. I think if you type that in into Google, it'll come up. Or it's um, it'll it'll be there. I can give it a link to it anyways. Um, so yeah, okay. so that starts in in June again. Okay, so people shouldn't wait till June third then to sign up, since they'll just find themselves on a waiting list. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think um, like this one, this one surprised me, but it gave me a lot of encouragement because it was Christmas. You know, obviously there's a lot of financial commitment around this time, but you know there was there was a really good um, interest in it, so we, which is really good. Um, so you know, I, I'm excited. I think you know, with when I continue to add good speakers to it as well, and continue to add the quality to it. You know, I, I hopefully it'll go from strength to strength. And I said, you know, it's all about you know quality and value for um, content. That's my my top priority with it, really. Okay. Well, yeah, and then let's uh, go ahead and spend a few minutes then talking about your, your injury prevention program. Yeah, so that that's like um, a six-week course, so it's like six sessions. And what I what I've done is um, I've I videoed um, last year. I, I basically sat down and said, right, if I wanted a high-performance program, you know, and I had six weeks with a long-term injured athlete or, or an athlete that kept, you know, breaking down in adverted commas, how would I progress the athlete? So what I'd done was I videoed, I, you know, we hired a professional studio and that, that's where some of like those pictures that you see with the white background were taking. Mm-hmm. And I basically sat down and progressed them. So the first 10 days, we, we spent a lot of time on the kind of breeding aspect of it. Excuse me, you see like a lot of the PRA kind of influence in that. Um, and then, you know, once we have that kind of airway secure as it were, and we've got that diaphragm and pelvis floor moving well, then we progress them you know, into some low low level stuff, um, into kind of again those gaze type patterns. Um, again, you'd see PRI kind of low load stuff there, and then we get them up onto their feet, um, and we start you know challenging their base of support, which is kind of where you'd see the the three dimensional movement stuff, the kind of Gary Gray, Gary War type approaches, and then my own kind of progressions on top of those is then just higher load, so we kind of bring them up to. Um, you know, single leg versions of these, and then we go through the hopping um, progressions as well. So that's like an actual six week course. And then what I've done is I've put six weekly lectures as well, but I've actually made the six weekly lectures more um, about different facets of an essentials of injury prevention course for myself. Um, so like week one, I kind of give my own thought process on, you know, when I, you know, when I, when I went to the Giants, um, I completely read on their injury prevention program, basically. Um, and, you know, when I sat down, kind of what I'm looking for, what I was going through, what my movement screens were. Um, and then in the second day, then it's all about like the second week's lecture. It's all about like the the objective markers you use during the day on a daily basis, what they're telling you, how to react to them, how to feed back to, to the S&C coaches, how to work with them. Um, and then we we spent the week on kind of the um, importance of the deceleration program. So kind of putting together a, a structured progressive deceleration program for the athletes um, and just kind of, you know, re- reviewed the literature out there and kind of how I apply it and, um, and my thoughts on it um, and how I pro- how design my, my rehabilitation uh, progressive deceleration program. 
Um, and then week four, um, we we spoke about, um, I think it was like the role of other factors in um, in injury prevention, such as your massage. So, you know, your athletes, you know, what are you actually massaging? And, and, and you know, you know yourself, Joel, like especially with kind of an understanding of, of PRI that if we, you know, one of my pet hates is massaging the lower back and just leaving athletes like that. And, and it's, it's a real bugbear for me and you know I warned my my um, sports masseurs at the Giants at the time you know do not massage the lower back and just leave it there you know you need if that you're taking away that protective response you need to get something back or certainly reassure that nervous system one way and you know I've had you know before big important games I've seen an athlete get his lower back massaged and all of a sudden that protective response is, is decreased a little bit he's fine he feels a little bit looser goes out training and then his glute tightens up, you know, there's a protective response somewhere else. So just kind of talking through that kind of side of it, how I'd structure my, my soft tissue team into, you know, rather than just massaging what they feel is tight, actually having a look and, and being a bit more practical with that. And then I cover a lot of the, the weight distribution stuff, the kind of biggest mistakes I see in the gym um, as well. And then looking at kind of recovery programs. So once your athletes finish their sport or their game, you know, how do we truly get them? into rest and digest, you know, and, and how do we get the nervous system away from fight or flight? And especially in rugby where they're, they've gone, you know, in American football type sports, they've gone through a car crash essentially on the game. So what does their nervous system think of that? A lot of our athletes can't sleep after games, you know, so it's feeding that, that fight or flight system even more. So how can we kind of intervene quickly on a, on a Sunday or a Monday or whenever they've played and restore them back is somewhere between rest and digest and fight or flight so they're recovered ready to go for two days time when their first training session is again so taking you kind of through kind of practical practically how i apply that really um and then the the last two lectures then are just kind of spent more on um on kind of practically applying this program so how to put it into into actual real life situation you know how you know how much of an emphasis i put on sets and reps for for certain parts of the year so for instance like pre-season for me it's very much you know these athletes are being driven into PEC positions you know already just extensive you know fight or flight respiratory distress positions where they're just trying to breathe you know because they're just getting flogged out in the field on conditioning they're deadlift and max weights they're squatting they're bench pressing everything's an extension so my injury prevention program at that stage would predominantly be just take them out of that. You know, you're very much a PRI focused type, get full length through the diaphragm, full length through the um, pelvic floor again, get everything working together. Then SNC go out and do the same again to them next day. Then I do the same again. So it's just keeping them on some form of balance really. And then once the season starts and once the load starts to, to come down a little bit and they go into games, then I'll really work on keeping that movement variability. So the, all that three-dimensional movements, um, decelerating the body weight, decreasing perceived threats from, from games and stuff like that. So just how I, how I kind of structure my injury prevention program throughout the full season, really. Um, we talk a lot about that and um, a little bit about coaches as well and, and just how to talk to them. And then obviously just your kind of progressions through um, your program so going from you know your your lunges to your hops to then integrating into a deceleration um, pattern as well and that that's that six kind of one and a half one hour one and a half hour lectures and then obviously you have the actual program alongside it and I kind of towards the end of every lecture then I just go right week five this is where my head's at this is why I've done what I've done and I just kind of explain everything that that i've got in my own high performance program at the time uh, which again majority of it stands true you know um you know i don't think i'll change massively um as i go on i think i'll just be consistently trying to move those one percenters you know mm -hmm. yeah that's good and then i'll you said i'll link back to you know where people can find out more about the your programs and, and get that information and you know, with the interview, too, we'll link back to some of the things you've done on here before the webinars and the interviews because, like I said, I mean, you've been on here so much and, you know, it's yeah. great information. So uh, hopefully yeah, people funny, will be excited about these You, you kind of go through full, full circle, really. <laughs> well, you know, when you look back at some of the articles you read, and I, I think the core, you know, my core intention is still the same. 
what I'm trying to get at is uh, just just the way you go about it's just changed a little bit from experience, which which is natural, isn't it? Yeah. Sure. Well, and then is there anything else that you wanna you wanna hit on before we go today? Um, I don't know. I think I've talked a lot there. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Final words of wisdom. <laughs> probably probably talk too much to be honest. Um, no, I think like the I. One of the things I'm going to focus on um, this month in, in my own um, pro sport academy is, is just how, you know, there's a big question how to become a sports physio. And I think a lot of things, you know, I think us as therapists, what we need to improve on as well is our personal interaction with people, you know, and, and that's what that kind of my team I'm going to be driving this month with, with the pro sport academy blog is actually, you know, first and foremost, you know, having you know a real good presence on twitter on facebook and being very well read is very important and very good but actually you know get out there and start interacting with people and get better at talking to people and reassuring people you know with your own body language with your own you know how you talk to people the words you use you know i, I think that's a part of um of our profession that we don't spend enough time on. And that's something that I'm really keen to get speakers into the mentorship um, side of it as well, is actually us getting better at explaining stuff, you know, doing the basics extraordinarily well. You know, I think that's one of the most overlooked things um, in our profession at the moment. That's something I'm trying to get even better at. I want to be the best person at doing all these basics really, really well. That's kind of my goal for, for 2016 and, and, you know, and going forward. No, it's something I think is overlooked a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I would definitely agree with that. So, okay, well, yeah, we'll finish up there, Dave. And you know, as always, it's great having you on the site. And you know, always looking forward for more great information from you. And we'll get some people looking into these mentorship programs. 